Okay, we're here at Charterhouse Studios. Archie Gamble with your Yamaha drum kit, brand new. How many weeks old is it now? I've had it for about two weeks, and I've played it probably about half a dozen shows in those two weeks. Okay. I absolutely love them. You went to Nam. Yes. And this is where you saw them? Yes, this is the, uh, these drums are called the uh, Live Customs, and they're Yamaha's uh, newest product line, um, drum-wise. Um, they're actually not even out yet. This kit that you see here is the first kit in Canada, which they were kind enough to ship to me. They have a prototype at their offices that doesn't leave the building, but I got the first available drum set, which is amazing. And as you said, I went to the NAMM show in Anaheim in January of this year. That's where they unveiled them. Tommy Aldridge uh, did a thing at 9 o'clock in the morning showing, you know, unveiling these drums. So at that point, when I heard them, I fell in love with them, and I said, okay, I want some of these. So um, after pestering Sean Brown at Yamaha over and over again, uh, he, he was kind enough to just ship me the first kit that came off of, uh, off of the boat, literally from Asia. So beautiful oak drums, I love them. Uh, they used to have an oak kit called the Oak Customs, and um, you know, when it comes to Yamaha, I've always said that they don't make a bad drum, you know. But the Oak Customs weren't for me. It's, drums are, you know, a pretty personal thing. Yeah. I didn't really care for the for the Oak Custom sound for what I was going for. But I tried these at Nam, and these are exactly what I want. These are like you could have pulled these out of my imagination. Um, they attribute the difference in sound to uh, thicker shells, more plies. Um, they're warmer than the old customs were. They've got more projection and more punch. So, I mean, everything about this drum set, I love. Uh, the, the grain is beautiful on the, on the wood visually. All the chrome, uh, black chrome hardware on the drum, black shell interior. So on top of sounding great, they look great too. Well, it's a gorgeous looking kit. Thank you. I heard it last night for the first time live and it sounded amazing at the show. Thank you. Really, really nice. Now, for the people out there that don't know, what's the sizes of the kit? Yeah, um, <clears throat> starting to my left, uh, I've got a 10 inch uh, rock tom, standard depth, 12 inch uh, rock tom over here, again, standard depth, 16 and 18 inch floor toms, and uh, 24 inch kick drum. It's got like a cannon, that thing. Oh, it does. And uh, a 14 inch uh, snare, uh, again, standard depth. Right? I uh, like bigger sizes, but not uh, bigger in width, you know, yep. drum-wise. Now, I notice you don't use any muffling. You don't use the blue pads. You don't use easy rings. You like them wide open. Yeah, well, John Bonham is my favorite drummer, um, and that's the sound I aspire to. So it's um, I carry the moon gels in my stick bag just in case because there are some sound men that don't, care for wide open drums and, and you know, I want them to be happy as well, right? It's, it's a two way street where you're working with anybody. So, um, giving, you know, given my way, I was like drums as wide open as possible. They're drums that's supposed to have some life to them, you know, and you can control the presence with your playing, with your hands and your fingers and your, and your wrists, you know? So I find if you deaden up a drum, there's nowhere to go. There's that and you can't go up from there. Yep. If you've got a wide open drum, you can go dynamically up or down. The drum is open, it's not it's not dead and so it's up to me if I want to bring it up, I just hit it a little harder and I get a little more projection, a little more um, uh, you know, presence. Okay. Like Bonham. Yep. He was the king of that. I you know never been one thousandth of the drummer he was, but it's nice to aspire to that kind of sound. Now, we've got the kit mic'd up with Shure microphones. Over and above that, <clears throat> excuse me, you have endorsements. Yes. And the way I've always looked at it is your endorsements are based on the credentials you bring to the table. I'm talking about Archie Gamble himself. Mm -hmm. um, because they don't hand them out lightly. You have endorsements with Yamaha and Sabian. Uh, same in symbols, um, regal tip sticks, Remo heads, and uh, those are the ones that I basically focus on right now. It's uh, work with those companies, and I used 
that stuff before yep. I got the endorsement. So, you know, that is the key. Like, a lot of younger drummers will ask me, you know, how do you get an endorsement deal? I'm not, I don't get endorsement deals because I've got platinum records on my wall and I'm touring arenas. It's, I'm a working drummer, which is just as important at another level because like, the whole thing with the uh, endorsement deal is to get the product out there seen and heard. And I mean, it's funny because initially I've made the connections with these companies, most of them. Uh, but for example, I'll start with Sabian was the first company I signed with. And my band Buffalo Brothers had signed a record deal with Attic Universal Records. And uh, when you're in that position, it's a little easier to get yep. endorsements because they realize that you know if you're filming a video, the product's going to be placed in the video and that uh, you're going to be on tour. People are going to see it. So it's a little easier to get an endorsement in that situation. So that opened the door for me. And um, to Sabian's credit, up and down over the years, I've, I've been in, you know, band with a record deal, lost a record deal. And then I started playing with Helix, a band that had gold and platinum records. They kept me on the roster. Left that to play with The Joys. The Joys had a large independent following and sold a lot of CDs off of the stage. Yep. And Sabian could have dropped me at any point in time. We're talking, they signed me in 1995. And they haven't. And I think that they realize now at this stage in my life that I'm um, a freelance musician, that I, you know, I work hard, so the product is going to be out and seen. And I always let other drummers play my equipment. I'm not a prima donna about that. I want them to, to hear it for themselves. So that's just as important in some ways as it is, uh, you know, Chad Smith and the Chili Peppers uh, playing in front of 10,000 people. It, and it... it Apples and oranges, but at the same time, they're both fruit. You yes. Know? Yep. Oh. Um, you play over 200 shows a year, and since since I've known you, you've done that consistently. So you're in demand because, and my respect for you as a friend is one thing. My respect and admiration for what you can do on a drum kit is a notch or two above that. Well, thank you. <laughs> and. You're probably the most demand drummer I know because you play with Jason Mercer, you do the Nasty Alex show, mm -hmm. um, you do recording for other artists. Yeah. You never stop working, which is a huge, huge pat in your back because people have trust in you. They, they believe in what you can bring to the table. There's not a doubt in their mind. Mm. For the young drummers who are out there, not to necessarily get to the point you're at, because you've worked your tail off for years and years and years to get to this point in time. Mm -hmm. But just a hint or two, to the young drummer wanting to come up to be a working drummer and looks at Archie Gamble and says, wow, um, he plays consistently, he plays a lot, he's in demand by excellent musicians. How do I get to that point? Well, there's a number of factors involved. I mean, I'm certainly not uh, Neil Peart. Technique-wise, I mean, I, I know that I'm a good player, but there's a lot of people that are um, better musicians. Um, but it's not the whole ball game, and and you know, it's an ongoing process for me. I've been playing clubs for coming up for 30 years, and I'm still learning what to do and what not to do. And, you know, it's taken me long, longer to learn some things than it has others. But I mean, it's not just about the playing, although that's important. I mean, one thing I always attribute, uh, whatever success I may have in terms of working a lot is that I'm v fairly versatile. I mean, I'm primarily a rock drummer, but I can sit down and play a country gig or a blues gig and yep. and, and get through it. Yep. You know, I've even done reggae shows, gotten a call at the last minute to play reggae, and I can play basic reggae. The point being is that your arsenal should have more than one weapon in it, you know what I mean? You should be musical. That's the most important thing. Uh, I, I can't remember who this quote is attributed to. It's that drummers don't hire drummers. Musicians hire drummers. So by virtue of that fact, you should be a musician. And that is an important thing, play for the song. The only thing I, the first thing I always tell young drummers if, if and when they ask. Um, and there's a lot more that goes with the package. I mean, be professional. And that's something I'm still learning things about after all these years, speaking frankly. There's, there's situations where you learn something new all the time. Be the person that people want to play with. Yep. Don't be the you know the moody artist that might be great, but everyone thinks you're 
my knob. You know, <laughs> I mean, like really. Um, and hey, I, I I certainly don't have a perfect track record, uh, track record. I'm sure, like anyone, there's going to be people you work with where there's chemistry just isn't yeah. there. But I try and be pleasant, be on time, and uh, you know, just be someone that people want around and be a good musician, and you'll be fine. Work hard and hustle. That's another thing. I mean, you can't expect that it's going to come to you, and that's the biggest misconception I see amongst musicians, young and old. Is that you know? Well, why don't I get more gigs? If I had a manager, I'd I'd be further in my career. If I had an agent, I'd be working more. I don't have either. I'm my agent. I'm my manager. Yeah. And the combination of hustling, getting on the phone emailing, making contacts with people, and also being someone that people hopefully want to work with, you put those two things together, you know, you'll be somebody that people want to call. And then eventually it snowballs, and it does get to the point where you're not hustling quite as much and people are contacting you, which I'm kind of at that stage. I'm certainly no Kenny Aronoff when it comes to that, but I mean, my phone rings a lot, and I try and live up to people's expectations to show up with the material learned yep. on time, and I hate to say it and burst anyone's rock and roll bubble, but show up sober and stay that way, you know? And that's, you know, again, speaking frankly, that's something that um, I, I, I'm i a sober person by choice for the last three years. That's off to you. But man. when I did, well, thank you, but when I did drink, I was mindful of, of you know, there's a line that you do not cross. You have a good time, you have a few drinks, and, and you know, it's always good to have a couple beers and loosen up a little. But don't cross that line. Yep. You know, and uh, that's another factor involved too. The, all these things just, you, you have to be somebody that people want around for a variety of reasons. And being a good live performer is important too. Knowing your situation. Uh, if I'm hired as a sideman for an acoustic based act, let's say, I'm not going to be back there playing drums as hard as I can, spinning my sticks in the air, taking away from the, the delicate singer songwriter that's in front of me. It just doesn't work for the situation. Yep. A hard rock band hires me and it's all about energy, blah, blah, blah. And then, yeah, you know, there's going to be sticks flying and hair going all over the place. And then, know your role in the situation that you're in. You self-taught? Uh, yes. Uh, I had a few lessons when I was younger. And uh, I was given a book and a practice pad and a press sticks. And they somehow ended up under my bed. And I ended up just going back to playing along to Kiss records, you know. Yep. Um, but, I mean, I've got a number of teachers. John Bonham, you know, Alex Van Halen, early Peter Chris, you know, uh, just listening to music and trying to decipher for myself what I liked about each of those drummers and taking a little bit, putting it into a blender and mixing it up, you know. Um, and, not to mention, there's a, we are so lucky. We live in a, an amazing country with an amazing music scene. And locally... There are some fantastic players here mm -hmm. and across this nation. You see somebody, by all means, if you see something they're doing, take it for yourself and make it your own. And don't be shy to ask. I thought, I'll always ask a drummer, how did you do that? That's really cool. You know, sometimes they show me and, and, and I can do it. Sometimes I can't. But then I, I filter it through the old gray matter and it comes out the other end as mine. You know, or as close to Mine as can be. Can I tell you a little secret? You can. All the times I come out and see you at whatever project you're at, and I'll hear you do something, so I think, okay, it's going to come up again. And I watch. The only problem is, you're too damn fast. <laughs> <laughs> this old mind can't absorb it all. Wow, that's a nice but, compliment. Thank you. Um, do you practice on a daily race, on a daily basis? No, to be honest with you, I don't. Um, it's probably the one thing I'm most guilty of is I'm not a solo drummer. I play for 10 minutes by myself and I'm bored. I need to play with other musicians to, to get the, um, the chemistry and interaction. I, I can't, honestly, 10 minutes tops. And then really? I'm like, okay, well, you know, I have a short attention span also, but it's never been about um, impressing other drummers with me. But, you know, I'll go to a drum clinic and I'll be like everybody else, just watching somebody with superior technique and my jaw will be on the floor. And I have respect for it and it's amazing. 
But I also have respect for, you know, Olympic divers. I don't want to do that either, right? You know what I mean? I, I can admire it, but it's not for me. For me, music is, is music. It's not, yep. uh, watch what I can do. But, you know, you should have, you should have some, some things in your, in your arsenal. Again, some chops, right? I mean, and there are occasions in my life where I do lock myself in a room and I say, okay, I really like that thing I saw somebody doing. And, um. Uh, Work it out. And I'll work it out to, to a degree that I'm happy with. And then I'll try and apply it in a musical, uh, in a musical passion, you know? And so that's about the extent of my practice regime, right? Yeah. Okay, well, I think we should put to use this cat that's sitting in front of us and let you do what you naturally do so well. Sure. So, thank you, my friend. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>